Good morning again, everybody. So um, as I was uh, going to say before, so I'm going to talk to you about um, EG basics. I am uh, trained as a clinical um, neurophysiologist and I use EG for um, clinical, um, um, in, in my clinical uh, um, daily, daily life and also uh, for, uh, for research uh, with advanced uh, EG analysis techniques. So I know probably some of you have experience with the EEG, maybe some um, even uh, so are experienced uh, experts in EEG, some other maybe have uh, less experience with EEG, maybe some of you use only EEG that has already been recorded and only analyze the EEG, but not uh, are not part of the recording uh, session. So I will cover a bit uh, the, the basics of uh, what is important when you think about analyzing an EEG. Oh, how do I look through slides like this? So EEG is almost 100 years old. Um, it was in 1926 that Hans Berger in uh, Germany performed the first recordings of the brain electrical activity using two electrodes, one uh, over the posterior brain areas. Uh, and one right against one's reference electrode um, uh, in front of the ear. And he recorded what we all now uh, well know as the alpha rhythm, so the oscill oscillatory activity between 8 and 12 cycles per second that is typical of the awake brain um, posterior regions. Of course, EEG technology has evolved a lot, and uh, now it's used uh, for a wide range of applications in the clinical um, setting. So for diagnosing, disease monitoring and prognosis. Um, first of all, probably in epilepsy, but also in sleep disorders, in disorders of consciousness, uh, in different types of comas, and also for a large spectrum of cognitive disorders. It's also used a lot, and it's probably what you are interested in as a research tool, as a brain mapping tool to map the what resting states, so the um, brain activity when we are not engaged in a specific task, but also for measuring responses to different stimuli. EG, as you know, is um, very attractive for its very high temporal resolution to study brain dynamics. It causes no irradiation, it is repeatable, and long recording duration are possible. So the first question is, of course, what is uh, underlying the EEG signal that we record in the scalp? And uh, you probably all know that uh, single cells are characterized by um, their action potentials. And so the membrane of a single neuron is a negatively pol polarized at rest and, uh, and the cell through the dendritic tree received a sum of, um, of uh, ongoing inhibitory and excitatory stimuli. And so when the, excited, the resulting excitation reaches, reaches a certain threshold, then you have a depolarization of the membrane and uh, the cell, the neuron generates action potentials. These action potentials are all very short in the order of a few milliseconds. They are very stereotyped. Every neuron um, expresses only one type of action potentials. And the coding of the information is done by the frequency of discharge of the action potential and not by its shape or its morphology. These action potential, they um, are so short and so local that basically they cannot be recorded at the surface of the scalp. What we record basically with the scalp EG is a different signal. So here you have an illustrative example of a population of cortical neurons here. And basically this is the dendritic tree and you see here the soma and, um, and the axon that uh, it goes down. And so when you have an excitation, you have a positive potential inside the dendritic tree. So negative value outside in the extracellular space and this creates a microscopic dipole between the dendritic tree and the soma of the cell that is relatively more positively charged. And so if you have a sufficient population of neurons that are oriented in the same direction, 
These microscopic dipoles can create a macroscopic dipole that you can record um, at the surface. So you can see here that this electrode here is, has a negative activity or potential compared to the neighboring region. So this is uh, the origin of the scalp EG. Of course, there are several conditions that need to be filled so that we can record something on the scalp. So you need a large enough dipole, which means that you need a large enough population of neurons generating it, and you need an alignment, because if you have a large number of cells that are oriented uh, in a random way or in a radial orientation, it causes a closed electric field, and you don't record anything at the surface at a distance, whereas if you, have a par you need a parallel orientation to record a macroscopic dipole. You will hear more about that in other talks of the summer school because this can, of course, become a critical issue when we record acti neuronal activity around uh, cortical gyrus because the facing parts of a sulcus can be canceling each other in terms of electrical signal. There is also, of course, an importance about the neuronal synchrony. I told you that action potential are also not only too small, but also and too local, but also too short, uh, too, too short lasting to, to sum up. And so, of course, signals must coexist in time. So cellular population need to be synchronized. Here you have a dummy example of six neurons and you see the six traces. We can see here that if the six neurons population or neural population have weak synchronization, then it gives rise to an irregular signal. And the sum of it has a relatively high frequency and a low amplitude. In the opposite situation, if you have a strong situation, you have a much more regular signal, much more synchronized between the electro, the neurons or the neural population, and then gives rise to a sum with a low frequency and a high amplitude due to the increased summation. And this is, of course, underlying the general rule of the, the spectral power of the EEG, where lower frequency have much higher power than weaker frequency, uh, than higher frequency. Of course, for the recording settings, you need some conventions so that people can uh, agree on what they measure and compare it. So for clinical recordings and also uh, for other applications, you have conventions on the name and the labels of the electrodes, of course, with a uh, typical location normally placed on what is called the 1020 international montage. So uh, with all electrodes distant from 10% or 20% uh, from a basic anatomical landmark like the nasian, the inion, and the preauricular pre points. Of course, you can make this sampling denser by adding electrodes, usually always at half distances, and give rise, this gives rise to the 1010 system or even some more higher uh, uh, spatial sampling density. You can record the EEG with different kinds of electrodes. You have electrodes that are glued. You have electrodes that, that um, are set in a cap so that they have prefixed position. It makes it much easier to use. And these are the system used mostly in the clinics. And of course, for research, most of the time, uh, use uh, EEG caps with uh, more or less electrodes. Here we have a system with a basic clinical uh, uh, electrode number with uh, around 20 or 25 electrodes. And here you have a, a EEG system with a high density of electrodes with 256 electrodes. As you can see on the, on the scheme above, so these high density electrodes, they cover the brain with a much higher spatial sampling, and this is particularly important if you want to record low, so brain areas, especially in the lower temporal lobe, um, because otherwise with the, the low density sampling, usually we miss this part of information. Okay, so here in red, you see the clinical sampling, uh, routine sampling, and in blue, the high density information. I, I told you that it is, um, repeatable and long term. So this is why some, some systems uh, can be glued for longer recording in the clinics, also for research. 
but of course you don't need sedation even in a moving child you can always find the time and the patience to record it and to put the electrode and then to find a quiet moment to record it so this is also one of the advantage as you know there are some aspects that you need to be very careful about if you record your e when you record the eg of course this is a low amplitude signal signal so it needs to be amplified and then low impedance is needed that's why most settings conductive paste or solution needs to be used and for the recording then the reference is very important you are measuring your voltage so there's no absolute value but only a difference compared to a reference electrode and of course if, if you it's necessary to put your reference over the midline or to have some average between two uh, lateralized electrode because otherwise you basically you can <clears throat> completely distort your signal and um, the signal that you record is heavily depending on your uh, reference you can imagine that you have if you have a, an activity of interest or a pathological activity that is close to the reference signal it will be represented in the reference and therefore in all the electrode signal and it will be more or less cancelled in the electrodes that are close to the reference so this is very important for the recording and it's also important for the post-processing and you need to carefully uh, reference or re-reference your signal. It's also important to have a correct frequency sampling uh, um, for, for your signal because you probably all know the Nyquist uh, cutoff frequency and you need, of course, to have at least the double of the frequency sampling from the frequency, the maximum frequency of the signal you want to analyze to avoid aliasing with lower frequencies. Frequency filters are very important for some analysis that you may want to do. You normally should be very careful to have the, uh, the least filter possible uh, during the recording to ensure that you can uh, uh, have a good quality uh, of the signal and is not distorted by hidden artifacts that you just um, that you just uh, hide away uh, with, with your filters. That you use filters in the post processing to say to select frequency bands um, or correct uh, for some artifacts. Always being careful that filtering can also remove in signal of interest and not only artifacts. I told you about the alpha rhythm. It's of course not the only frequency and there are some conventions, uh, arbitrary conventions about uh, frequencies uh, and frequency bands to describe the EG. So you have the alpha band that is a characteristic of the posterior brain area in the awake um, uh, brain and then beta frequency that you find normally more in the anterior frontal regions. Theta and delta are slower frequencies that we normally don't find in the adult brain. Uh, in the healthy condition when the uh, subject is awake, but this is characteristic of sleep pathology, and you also find it in normal conditions in uh, children because of the brain maturation. So how does a normal EEG look like? This is a representation of a normal EEG where you can see the right side of the brain on the upper channel in the upper channels and the lower on the and the left side on the lower channel. So you see these alpha rhythms in the posterior electrode that is attenuated by eye opening. So these big triangular waves are eye motions. And um, I, I will come back to artifacts later. So you can see that there is a nice posterior to anterior gradient, a nice free activity, and there is no slow activity on this page where you see 10 seconds per page. The, the, the yellow lines here are 10 seconds. So this is the way where we look at EEG in clinical recording. Um, and this is the wake EEG and in sleep, of course, the EEG changes a lot. You have different stages of sleep, as you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, going deeper in the non-REM sleep. And then you have the REM sleep, where the EEG is similar as in the wakefulness, but with rapid eye movement and muscular atonia, so basically there's no muscle activity except for the eyes and of course, hopefully respiratory muscles. These are examples where you can see here that uh, 
The nice alpha rhythm that we saw here loses its spatial gradient and drops out progressively. And then it gives rise to a slower EEG with slower waves, but superimposed typical sleep figures that are described as vertex waves. These are physiological activity that mark the different sleep stages. So you can see some sharper activity here. You can see what is called K complexes, uh, big slow wave with followed by fast oscillations and the sleep spindles that are fast oscillation in the beta range in the anterior regions and over the midline. In deeper sleep, you have an increased amount of slow wave activity, still some additional figures like sleep spindles, so a completely different spectral distribution as in the awake age. So the EG changes according to brain states, and it is of course also confounded by artifacts. You have different sources of artifacts, the biological artifacts, um, the eye, all the activity, all the artifacts are basically caused by electrical activity of other parts of the body than the brain. You can see here that the eye is causing some artifact when there are high movement because the, the cornea and the retina form a dipole. So whenever this dipole moves, it causes a change in the electric field on the scalp and is reflected in the EEG. So you have this big triangular waves. The tongue creates also a dipole between the tip and the base of the tongue. So when you speak, your tongue moves, or when you chew, your tongue moves, and then this also creates some slow frequency artifact. The face mus muscles create some faster activity artifact, and the EKG, the heart, uh, can also be seen on the EEG because the EKG is a much stronger signal than the brain uh, signal, and uh, uh, depending on the condition, you can see it also recorded on the head. Next to the biological artifact, of, of course, you can have technical artifacts like bad electrodes or line noise also contaminate your signal. Now, of course, uh, after all these uh, artifacts, you can also record uh, uh, pathological activity, and that's what you may be interested in if you're performing clinical studies. And pathological activities are roughly divided into slow activity and sharp or epileptiform activity. So if it's focal slow activity, then it's usually the marker of a structural focal lesion. If it's diffuse or generalized, it's more related to brain states or arousal or some degree of uh, brain dysfunction called encephalopathy or coma, if it's more severe. If you see epileptiform activity, then if it's focal, it's usually related to a structural cause or looking for a structural lesion and you correlate your findings with it. Or if it's generalized, then it's more often a situation with a genetic forms of epilepsy. And of course, if you see epileptiform activity, you want to see whether this is a marker that you record between seizures, interictal, called interictal uh, uh, patterns, or ictal pattern during seizure, which is much more rare and, um, unless you do prolonged age. These are a few examples where you can see here on the left side, you have a slower activity than on the right side, you have a focal slow activity. And here you have a generalized slow activity. And um, for epilepsy, just a brief introduction to remind you or tell you that epileptic seizures are caused by transient symptoms uh, related to excessive and synchronous activity of a neuron population. So excessive signal from the extracellular um, uh, milieu, as we saw before. And the epilepsy is the Enduring predisposition to, of the brain to generate these seizures. So these seizures can be focal, um, uh, concern only one part of the brain with some propagation possible, or generalized, and usually this relates to pathological activity of thalamocortical circuits, so that affects more like the two hemispheres synchronously. Of course, the clinical manifestation and the EG expression of the seizures 
depend on the brain region and its particular function. A few graphic examples here of a focal epileptic activity that you can see here only on some channels with this sharp activity followed by the uh, after going slow wave related to the uh, surrounding edition. And this is more of a generalized epileptic activity between seizures. So this is used in the clinics and in some research project, of course, as well, as a marker of epileptic activity in the absence of clinical manifestation. And this is used, of course, for diagnostic and prognostic uh, information. This is a seizure, so you can see it's not only one short transient activity of a few hundreds of milliseconds, but I'm not sure about the, oh, the quality is not so good, I'm sorry, but you can see here some rhythmic activity developing over the left hemisphere with increased amplitude. So a focal seizure and here a generalized seizure that starts simultaneously in the two hemisphere with a typical frequency of thalamocortical loops. So we've seen that the EG is the sum of different components. You have artifacts that you hopefully try to correct at the recording, uh, at the moment of the recording. You have physiological rhythms and sharp transient that can be physiological, like the sleep transients. You can have norm variants that are not pathologic, but happen only uh, in a minority of individual and they can mimic pathological activity and you can have the pathological activity. So all these basically can, uh, um, can influence your EEG uh, activity um, in a very significant way. And you should be aware of this and look for it in your recording because they may uh, not happen in the same way or with the same uh, frequency in the different condition and may alter your, your um, analysis. And you can see here in the box that there are different types of sharp activity that can have different causes, like this is an EEG, ECG artifact, this is a physiological sleep activity, this is a norm variant uh, that occur mostly during sleep, and that looks like an epileptic spikes, but here is the epileptic spike. So there are normal and non-normal activity that uh, can have a profound influence of the, uh, on the content of the EEG. Um, so this was for the recording of the spontaneous brain activity. And of course we can perform evoked potentials with the EEG and the principle of the evoked potential is to test specific neural circuits using the electrophysiological responses to a physical or cognitive stimuli. So the classical and simple cognitive, uh, uh, sorry, this classical and simple evoked potential that are performed in the clinical setting are like the visual evoke potentials, usually it's checkerboards or flashing lights, or the somatosensory uh, evoke potentials with an electrical stimulation of a peripheral nerves at the wrist or at the ankle. And of course, uh, research has developed all kinds of cognitive and other psychophysical uh, stimuli to probe different uh, brain circuits. And of course, the single response to a stimulus have a very low amplitude and are, and are usually lost in the background of the EEG spontaneous fluctuation. So you need to have repeated uh, stimulation and usually a high number of them to build uh, an average uh, response that is locked on the, on the stimuli. And basically you have a some cancel, cancellation of the background activity with the averaging and you see the average uh, response of the brain to the stimulus. Usually um, it's, uh, you have to repeat the stimulus for uh, several dozens of times, it depends some, some stimuli have a stronger response and uh, sometimes can be uh, a bit less, but and, uh, for some in the clinical setting, for instance, the the somatosensory evoke potential is more like hundreds of hundreds of repetitions. Um, so then you can, of course, compare the response between two conditions um, and, um, and perform the EG analysis on the evoked potentials instead of the spontaneous activity. 
So now you have your EG, and uh, I think that there will be several presentations and talks at the summer school presenting you the different types of analysis and application that you can do with the signal. And um, uh, this is an illustrative slide to a um, mise en bouche uh, to show you again that, of course, we can analyze the signal of each channel uh, in terms of a temporal. Um, a temporal signal, but you can also look it in a more spatial way by, uh, by looking at the EG voltage map at each particular time point, you can have a map and then the EG can also be seen as a succession of spatial voltage map on the scalp. And of course, this is also the case for the evoked potentials, you can look at the different time points of the evoked response as different maps. And you will see in the follow in the following um, uh, talks that you can from this map estimate the localization of the electrical generators of the signal and then perform different kinds of analysis like connectivity analysis based on these source reconstructions. So I hope I have convinced you, but not scared you too much that uh, many EEG signals don't come from the brain and it's important uh, to ensure good recording conditions and settings to uh, have uh, the best uh, data set available. You need to identify and or exclude the influencers of the signal like artifacts, arousal states, uh, differences, normal and pathological transit activities so that you can then uh, have a nice data set and enjoy your next analysis. Thank you very much for your attention.